This video is supported by EmuDB, the lightweight, high-speed immutable database for systems and applications. Can you guys hear me? I think Ian can hear me. Hello David, hello Fabio, hello David, hello Steve, hello Ian, hello Kuglin P. So I think we're off to the races. So, um, let's get started. Let's put some music on. If it's too loud, you guys let me know. And I'm sharing here, this screen here, which you see, that's my Mac here in the office. And I have here to the side of the mouse here, I have uh, another screen where I, where I monitor the chat and where I, um, where I uh, have some sessions already set up. So, um, today we're going to talk about VAX VMS and um, first of all as you know this is the first ever live stream for me uh, usually uh, for the videos that are on my channel there is a lot of preparation that goes into it so it takes me on average I want to say maybe two three hours to record the video maybe another two three hours to edit it make it ready um, and then you and because I travel a lot I spent about 50 percent of my time traveling what i do is i prepare three or four or five videos and then stack them up so that um so that they are released while i'm traveling usually in europe or in other parts of the world and um and so a lot of preparation goes to those videos and for me it's now almost natural to to speak to the microphone knowing that some you know people at later stage are going to listen to them and uh, I have a lot of things that I do wrong when I record videos and uh, I say a lot of ams as you all know it's kind of my trademark by now and so when I when I record those videos I only have I always have like two or three people in my mind that I know will watch those videos and I kind of talk to them um, to you know when I make those videos I'm trying to I, I visualize those few people and I and, and I visualize myself talking to them and see how they would perceive what I'm saying, what I'm doing. One of them is Professor René Fernand, who is a friend, and visited him last year in, uh, in Montreal, in Canada. We spent uh, uh, two great days together doing stuff. Another one is uh, uh, Michael Richmond, who is one of the uh, very, um, very, uh, uh, you know, from the, he was there from the very beginning. And so it was a picture him listening to this, and there's two or three other people who I always picture uh, listening in, and uh, and uh, it makes it easier for me to make my videos. So in this case, there's a whole bunch of uh, you guys there, and uh, it's a little bit unusual for me. So please bear with me. So I wanted to show my Vax VMS setup. Uh, even though I love mainframe first and foremost, um, I've in the la I've for the last maybe five six years I've been playing with. Vax VMS. I never really professionally worked with it. I've seen it here and there a little bit. In the military, our rockets were back then for sure, maybe still today, controlled by Vax VMS machines. And I, I saw them from far, but I never really actually touched one. But there's one or two episodes I want to tell about Vax VMS. One is that, hey Sebastian, how you doing? Good friend in Germany. And uh, one episode is that on my bar mitzvah trip in uh, 1980, <laughs> um, I I went to Australia to visit my family, and my cousins they uh, they lived in the Sydney Newcastle area, and my older cousin uh, he was a student at Newcastle University in uh, of the, uh, this University of New South, what is it called? Uh, southwest or something of australia and the university there and he was a, a physics student and they had just two weeks before they had installed the vax 11780 and uh, when i got here he took me to the data center and they had just installed it i'd never before seen a computer in my life And he started to show me, and there was a console, I remember VT50 terminal, and he started to show me what uh, 
what what the computer is and one of the things we did is he launched space wars the game and uh and this was within five feet of the vax 11 780 and i didn't pay that much attention to the computer because it was just a big um because it was just a big uh, uh thing standing there but i was fascinated by the game and from that moment on i knew i love computers so um that's why i like vax vms and I've had a number of years this image here, which is running on the same age emulator. And uh, thank you, Lava Q, for saying that I'm much younger than you thought. I'm maybe not that much younger than you thought, but uh, so um, yeah, I can see that the old stream is still in the video. I don't know how to remove that. I hope people will start stop writing there, and they should all be typing on the chat for this video I, I don't know how to remove that there's something wrong with the youtube uh, streaming software that's also why i need to start a whole new event sorry about that anyway so i have this image here called ketura ketura for people who wonder what the name is of this machine here um, i don't know if you see it well if i need to make it larger make it larger smaller um, was the second wife of abraham so Abraham, uh, his first Sarah, of course, was Sarah. The second wife was Keturah. And, uh, and so that's why I named the machine like this. And all the names of all my Vax machines are biblical women's names. Alrighty, so I've had this image for a while. If What it is is, uh, if I do show system, you will see that it is, it's a OpenVMS 7.3 running on the CMH emulator. And um, and uh, this machine has been up now for 59 days. I had to restart this machine because I did something stupid. I added it to a cluster and that was a stupid thing. And then I had to contact one of the people I know on the, on the what is it called, Discord channel. One of the people who are there frequently because he knew how to remove it from the cluster again. And so that's why I had to reboot it. But before that, it had been up for maybe, I don't know, three four months and uh, so I had this image provided to me by a friend in Finland Samsa who used to be extremely active on the Hecknet um, network if you look here the worldwide Hecknet network so this person Samsa out of Finland he was extremely active for a number of years and then he went quiet but he had a lot of machines and you see him here. Yeah, this guy here. So all these machines were run by him. And for a while I had access to some of those. This one was a central one. Gorvax, I can make it bigger maybe. Nope, I can't. Nope. Um, and, um, and then my machines are down here. So to, just to give you, they're all connected to Hacknet, which is kind of the pretty, they've been around for maybe 10 years. And my idea for HNet came about because of because of the existence of HackNet. So HackNet is for uh, what the heck net and HNet with us for the mainframe community is for Hercules network. So I have machines here somewhere if I can find them again. Yeah, so all these are my machines. So Kitura is this one, 31, Artus 141, Zilpa 142, we'll see that one in a second. Billa 143, Azuba 144, Dina 145. Mosh ML is a very special machine because that's actually a Linux machine that is providing the connectivity to the network. And then I have another few here. In the this is one. This one is an Ultrix machine, which we'll look at also here. And um, and then these two other machines. So he set up this machine for me about six seven years ago. And I always had it running at home in a cluster, but I decided to move it to Google Cloud. So all the machines that you saw here, they're all running on Google Cloud. I have a, I have a virtual machine I'm renting there. I can show it to you here. Um, it's not a big machine. It only has, I think, one. Uh, you can only see the center on my stream. Oh, let, let me check out what's going on here. Why can you only see the center? So, display capture. Crop none. OK. 
Can you see it now? Fabio, can you tell me if this the crop is now better if I move it to the left? It should be fine. Can you see the whole screen? This is all there is. I mean, it should be. Oh, yeah, it's slightly. I can say it disappears when I move it here. Now it disappears. So I'll try to keep it. Let me see when it disappears here to the right. Okay, so I'll try to keep it to the center of the screen. I think you can see that now, right? So I don't know what's with the software. I mean, next time it's going to be better, I promise. So I have this machine here. It's only one CPU. And it only has, I think, uh, two gigabyte of RAM of, of four or three and a half. I don't remember. Yeah, three and a half gigabytes, which is enough because this machine here is, uh, is I think, a 64 megabytes machine. Let's see. Monitor system. Uh, I think it's a it's a 64 or 128 megabytes machine, which fits, of course, fits comfortably in uh, in uh, in a uh, 3.7 gigabytes that I have on this virtual machine. And um, and then let's see what else. So we have on this machine we have a whole bunch of machines. So we have you can see here maybe six or seven VAX machines running. And you see the name of each one here, Zilpa, Bilia. And I even have a Hercules machine <laughs> with TK4 running for a machine that's connected uh, to HNet. And somewhere here I also have a machine that's running Ultrix. So I wanna say I have seven or eight mainframes or, or computers emulated on this machine. And uh, the CPU is at what, at 50%? And the memory is maybe at uh, two gigabytes, so really lightweight uh, for what it is today. For um, and so one CPU, three and three point seven gigabytes. It's the smallest virtual machine you can rent from Google Cloud, and I think it comes to about twenty four dollars a month or thirty dollars a month. So um, so that's really uh, you know you can fit a lot of stuff in one virtual machine. So then. Um, I have here the stuff running. It is connected to both um, HackNet as well as to HNet. So I can show you, for instance, if I do send command relay moon, I should maybe set the terminal right. Set, let me set the terminal so that it will recognize the width. Yeah, so I came back um, already. So, or I can say send command relay news mm, BBC. If I want the latest BBC news, and it should come back any second now with news. Yeah, coronavirus. So you can see here all that kind of stuff. So it is connected to, and I can also show you the monitor for the connection. So I have here a connection to Relay B over TCP IP. So TCP IP is working fine. And um, and then I have a connection to uh, another VAX, VAX2, which is actually inactive. We can restart it. And then I have a connection to another VAX by this gentleman, Super Team. I've mentioned him before in some videos. He is the... Um, Deck Vax networking expert extraordinaire. So, if we, if you search for Supratim uh, Vax VMS, his name will come up pretty soon. And so he has this, all these videos on how to get things started and how to get things working. Amazing guy, very friendly. Is up in Maryland somewhere. Maybe works for NSA. Who knows? And. Um, and uh, it tells you how to get things done. So with his help, so I'm connected to his one of his machines, and I'm also connected to another one of my machines here, uh, Houston Vax 2 and Relay B. So I can, for instance, uh, start 
let me see if that works yep so it's now connected As you can see that connected very quickly why because that other machine <laughs> is just a local network connection to the to the other machine here running on the same host so I can also now that I I'm there I can let me show you first of all dear um, what is the machine called I think that's the name yeah so as you can see now this is a decknet connection and all decknet machines also see hacknet so uh, let me see uh, your node a Eli DYR so let's see that dear Eli DYR somebody said he's also on hacknet mm. Eli DYR hey Ben how are you so um, no it the machine doesn't seem to oh Eli DYR let's see if I can reach it no nope, doesn't seem to be to be up uh, maybe you can ping me mr. Spencer or M Spencer I'm node 31 141 here so you should be able to do just like something like this dear 141 and you should get some of my utilities which I make available to everybody including my and Queens program everybody knows that first program I write in a new language or a new computer is the end Queens solver there's one so for eight Queens on the chessboard 92 solutions etc and you're able to download if you want um, command line is below crop okay let's make this a little smaller and then it should fit so you can see here run and Queens I have a version in basic I have a version in Fortran I have a version in C I have all these compilers I have Fortran here I have I don't have PL1 but I have CC I have basic of course and I have all these languages and I write yeah I saw I saw ELI no but it doesn't work so if I do ELI DYR if you give me the note number maybe I can find it by the note number oh Mr. S uh, M Spencer says it's offline that's why anyway so now let's start to explore the other machines I have so that's our set host Zilpa okay And now what you see here this is a much older version this is vax vms version 4.7 but of course decknet also runs uh, phase 4 also runs on those machines and you can see here i have jcp running as well so if i do this you can see here now i have my other computer here as well so i could do send command h u vax one show user and that doesn't seem to be working I don't know why but uh, it usually does and um, so this is a much older version and still connected to hacknet so I can do dear and I see the stuff here now there is certain things which you can do within here so now it goes to the hacknet uh, node names server which is called mim and downloads the latest version i don't have prolog or apl nick i wish i had apl i did a little bit of apl programming in the late 80s on a 3270 with the apl keyboard and uh, i liked it but never did anything other than that i did study math as my uh, for my bachelor degree so I liked APL a lot. So now it's downloading the node database here. And um, this usually takes a while because it's quite a big uh, quite a big list and the connection is obviously not very fast. And while we do that, I have here PyDecNet. There is a package written in Python that emulates the HackNet, the, the DECnet phase four network. And so uh, once you download this, it's it's on GitHub somewhere. PyDecNet is the name. 
uh, then with that you connect to somebody who, who somebody else who's connected to hacknet and by doing that then you gain connectivity to all the rest so uh, there's a configuration file it creates also a small web server where you can log in to see the status of the connection etc so that's how i connect to hacknet so i have pydecknet which is note number 31.149 if you remember what we saw there on the note names list i said it's a special one because it runs on linux so that's the one um, and so now it's updating the note database we don't need to do that let's go and hop onto the other computer uh, set host and now we have here as you can see fax vms 5.5 .5 which I think came out in 98, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, so version 5.5. .5. And um, that's all fine. This one is not connected to HNet. I didn't want to bother connecting it to HNet, but it is, of course, connected to HackNet. And um, I don't think I have anything other than basic on this one. Nope. Uh, CC. No, I didn't install any compilers on this one. Then, um, let's see what else we have. Let's return to Kitura. So, set host Azuba. And if I'm not mistaken, this one is member of a cluster. Uh, it wants a new password. Um, monitor cluster yeah and so I created here a machine of two or three nodes I don't remember right now there's so many of those it will show up here in a second yeah there's two nodes in this cluster yeah uh, APL is um, lava Q yes there is APL on MTS and I also have a version of APL for MVT and um, and uh, I have it running on MVT. I was talking about APL on M uh, VMS. I don't have that. I know it exists, but I don't have that. But I have, yeah, I have. Um, if you look, actually, there's a very nice distribution. If you want to talk about APL, there's a very nice distribution by Jurgen Winkelmann, the same person who made TK4, who is making TK4 soon, hopefully with update 9, MVT APL. ETH. If you search for MVT, APL, ATH, there's a whole distribution, amazing distribution. Uh, this one, which has APL in it. And it also has the fonts that you can install as part of PuTTY, the SSH client. If you install the fonts there, then you will be able to actually do APL uh, fonts on, uh, on, MV on MVT. So maybe I'll make a video about that in the future. This runs OS 360 MVT, the last version ever made by IBM 21.8F. And uh, I made some videos about MVT. I never made a video about MVT APL. But here is a great distribution for those who like APL. It works. It's amazing. It gives you the font with the special characters for APL. And it works fine. Um, and this is the IBM APL interpreter. So. Um, so it really works fine if, if you I don't know how to make the font here a little bit bigger but if, you, if you're interested in APL that's what you should look at put this aside so we have this cluster here with two machines they share uh, disks and they share network and they share other resources and you can connect to either one of those and then the users are are available on all machines so I've said it in other places but uh, clustering is actually one of the things I did in university because we wrote um, the Moshix um, single system image clustering software first for um, for RSX and then later on for Linux so if you look for Mosix cluster you'll land at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and you see there is a single system image uh, this is way too small but uh, so we wrote the single system image clustering software for Linux that makes 
several computers, as many as as you wish, um, uh, look like one giant computer. And the idea for that came from VAX VMS cluster. The VAX cluster, to my knowledge, is the most complete single system image clustering software. Yes, IBM has uh, the Sysplex, which comes, I would say, halfway, it goes halfway there in single system image clustering. And even the ZVM single system image clustering doesn't go as far as the VAX cluster. It's really amazing what this uh, soft, what this combination of hardware and software can do. You needed at the beginning special interconnects and disks that could be could have multiple hosts, but uh, later on they made it uh, more and more user friendly. And so I like this a lot. Um, uh, so this is my cluster. Now what I would like to do. And there's two nodes here. So in total, we have I have one VMS 7.3. I have a four. Let me see here. If I do set host, yeah. So I have yeah. This is 5.5. I have four six four seven. 5.5, 6, 1, 6, 6, and 6, 7, if I'm not mistaken. Let's look at the node database. There is no VAX image available. So Lava is asking uh, if there is a VAX image available like I did for the Cray image. No, because the Cray image is abandonware, and so there's no legal entanglements with making that available. However, with VAX, it's a little bit more complicated, especially now that there is a, a company in Europe that has uh, taken ownership of VMS. And of course, they are going to start to enforce, I think, licensing a little bit more than a, uh, HP did in the past. And so also the problem with VAX VMS is that the node name and the identity of the node is burned in, into many places in the queue management, in the spooling, in the spooling management, in the of course if you have a hacknet then it's kind of burned into the um, into the decknet uh, management. So to make a node available uh, without having this kind of uh, strong identity is, is very hard. And uh, and so the only way to do it is doing without DECnet configured, but then people will still stumble in configuring DECnet, which is not that hard, but uh, you, you know you need to know how to do it. So that's why I don't make one available. Uh, but if let's look here, uh, HackNet node list. Let's go back here. Let's see where all my machines are. So there's a person, and I suspect it's Ian. Maybe it's the same person that helped me with uh, getting my version 6 of VMS running. Let me see what the node name is for that one. Yeah, Hagar and AXA. So let's go to those machines. Log out, set host, Hagar, uh, set host, Hagar. Yeah, so you can see here it's uh, OpenVMS 6.1. Typed it wrong. Typed it, typed it wrong again. So one thing about uh, VaxVMS is it insists on strong passwords. You can try sometimes to force it to take uh, simpler passwords, but then sooner or later it will barf again. So... Um, so yeah, so if you look at this, this is maximum 6.1. And then there's another one. Uh, uh, same thing again. OK, so this one is uh, OpenVMS 6.2 from the early 2000s, I, I believe. And so um, this image is obtained from a person called Ian. Maybe it's the same Ian we see here on the channel in the chat window. Maybe yes, maybe no. But um, it all works fine. Now let's see how to physically configure those machines to connect configuration for Katura. So max ini. 
So of course we have the microcode, which with newer versions of same age, you know, actually the microcode is burnt into same age. Uh, okay, so it's not you, Ian. Sorry, there's another Ian. But um, so you have newer version of same age have the microcode, basically the ROM, burnt into the same age simulation or emulation software. Uh, then you need to give it some uh, non-volatile RAM or time of day and date is stored. So actually I was wrong. So this machine is 512 megabytes, way too much. I mean, I don't really need 512. So maybe I'll change that uh, soon and make it uh, 128 because I don't need more than that. Then you set CPU idle. And I don't know if this is, you can see that it's in the center of the screen. Uh, cut off on the left. So can you see it now? Um, so we have here this you don't need with a new version of SimH you don't need this line anymore because the ROM is there NVRAM you need to provide memory uh, yeah, 128 megabytes is more than enough because I don't really do that much um, and CPU idle that's important for older versions of um, SimH which is uh, how does this the emulator recognize when the image inside the emulator is not doing anything so since the architecture of VAX, it's not that clear when the processor is not doing anything. Because for instance, on the mainframe, on the S360 and S370 and Z architecture, when the CPU has nothing to do, it will actually stop. It will say it will set a stop bit. And so it's very, very easy for Hercules to recognize when the image is not doing anything. And, uh, and so then it doesn't have to emulate anything. But with the VAX architecture, it's not that simple, and so there is a detector inside SimH which tries to detect when the operating system has nothing to do, and it generally it works fine. So I always set that one, even though new versions of SimH apparently don't need it anymore, but I actually found one instance where it still needed it, and that's for Ultrix, which we'll look at to, into a second. Then I give it a couple of disks, so this is a bunch of disks here, some of them are huge ones, and um, and so here's where we attach the disks. So I have one, two, three, four, five disks and the DVD player and some tape drives. This is the tape drive that contains the image of the network job entry uh, emulation software for VMS, which is called JNet, which is abandonware as well. Uh, it was owned by a company which was acquired by Quest Software and then Quest Software, I used to be a chairman of Quest in uh, in Europe, and uh, and then um, and then Quest Software was acquired by Dell, and then it was acquired by HP, and so nobody cares about that stuff anymore. So here's the CD-ROM with the installation, and there's one thing you can do with SimH, which is you can provide um, terminal lines like serial lines and I give it here 16 lines and then you could actually tell that to this port here 1337 if you are in the image well, so if I do tell that localhost 1337 now I'm connected to Kitura so it's if you don't have network working then this is an easy way to connect um, have telnet connections to your to your machines okay so let's go down okay so now um, so I have also a console telnet which is spelled wrong actually okay on this port and but it's somewhat dangerous because like just like serial lines if you use that and you expose that to the internet uh, people are actually able to telnet in and if you don't log out they will still find the session running so be very careful with uh, this kind of uh, uh, setup here because if you don't block them, people from the internet will be able to hijack your sessions. So if you don't know what you're doing, just comment those out. Uh, and here comes the critical part. That's where most people stumble. And so, as you can see here, we have two network connections, two network interfaces, Ethernet interfaces. XQA, so if you don't say anything, it's just A by default. And then here I have XQB. And then I can make it maybe a little bit bigger if you want. Um, then you have to give it a MAC address, something that doesn't exist, that has no conflict with nothing else. And then I attach it to a network interface, 
a TUNTAP network interface, which is uh, level 2 networking. So Ethernet level 2. TUN is for level 3. TAP is for level 2. And, and so this one is for DECnet. So this is one that connects to my Python DECnet emulator. And, uh, and from there it goes to HECnet. And then this one is another network interface with a different uh, MAC address which connects to a VDE network interface, which is the one that connects to TCP IP. Okay, so this is TCP IP, and of course, network job entry goes, um, um, what is it, Nixus Quest Software, make Big Brother, best monitor, in my opinion, yes, I agree. Quest Software is great, as I said, I used to be on the board of uh, Quest Software in Europe for six or seven years, I was the chairman of the board. I love the company. It's not around anymore, but because um, Dell acquired it and ruined it in many ways. But that's just besides the point. So anyway, so there's this network interface, and I'll show network interfaces in a second. And then you just enable boot and start and all that kind of stuff. So now that we've seen that, let me show you how the network looks in this machine. So we have uh, Ethernet, which is the internal Google Cloud internal IP address. You don't see this address from the outside, obviously. Uh, people see a different, uh, there is a fixed IP for this machine on the outside, but I don't usually tell people because then they start trying to log in. Uh, then I have this tap interface, which is created a boot time with this IP. And then I have a second network with slightly different IP, 2.1 and another one 3.1. Then I have this tap interfaces, which are the ones that are connected to the TCP IP uh, interface here. Lava says, I hope TK4, TK, TK4 update 9 will have NG capability. Yes, it will. I can confirm that TK4 update 9 will have several enhancements. It will have the Rex uh, interpreter built in, Rex with TCP IP. It will have a uh, network job entry as as created by the amazing Bob Polmenter. And it will have a whole list and it will have uh, TCP IP headers in C so you can write TCP IP applications. And it will also have the fixes for the COBOL compiler, for the X reference of the COBOL compiler. The ALGO compiler was fixed. It has by the way, it also will have a update nine. Will have an interactive receive, uh, XMIT receive and XMIT, XMIT send. So a whole list of uh, kicks will not be part of it. So Lava just asked if kicks is going to be part of it. Nope, and that's because the gentleman who wrote kicks was an amazing developer, genius person, has sometimes weird ideas about making other people use his software. So. Uh, there's people out there, and I want to say this here, there's people out there um, who are from the mainframe world, they have a very, very strange way to look at um, at the software they create. They think that when they write a software, they have to protect it and make sure nobody uses it because maybe they think they're going to monetize it. And obviously that's completely old fashioned and uh, doesn't really work this way. The way to make things work is by making it open source and making it easy for people to use and copy and extend without having to ask you. The Apache licenses like that or the FreeBSD license. Um, because if you do that, people will start to use it because they're not encumbered by legal means. So so Kix is not going to be part of it. COBOL vSAM, uh, COBOL of course is going to be part of it, but not the COBOL compiler that knows vSAM because vSAM came after the COBOL compiler that's in TK4, so no. That's not going to be in it, um, but um, there is ways to make vSAM work with COBOL and Professor Onefrenlo made a video about that. So um, so these are my network interfaces. They're created at boot time. So if I go, ah. you see here, I execute a script which goes and configures all those additional network interfaces. And this is the ones you see here. So they created a boot time. And 
all virtual all my uh, Vax VMS machines must attach to to this one here for TCP IP communication and they must attach to one of this ones for HECnet uh, interface for being able to work with TechNet 4. Now there is another machine here, a particular one. Where am I? Okay, set host. Okay, so here we have a machine running Altrix 4.0. Altrix 4.0 was uh, the well, the fourth re major release of uh, Tech Unix, as they called it at the beginning. It went through several name changes. It became Altrix, then it became OSF, then it became True Unix. I mean, they made a mess with the Unixes there at Tech. Uh, they could have done a much better job. Uh, because they wanted, of course, to compete with people on the basis of VMS, because they controlled VMS. And the moment people started to use Unix too much, then they could switch between one Unix on DEC and maybe on Solaris. So that's why they were always a little bit, um, that a split personality about Unix at DEC. And uh, even though it's a great, um, yes, uh, it's true. People can also inspect open source software for backdoors and other ones. That's true, Zach. Absolutely true. So uh, people were... Uh, at DEC, they didn't do a good job with uh, the marketing uh, of their Unix. However, um, Linux, I don't know if people know that, uh, but Linux as we know it today is actually a descendant of Altrix. So from the very beginning, Linus Torvalds wanted, what he really wanted was to create an open source Altrix. That's what he set out to do in 94, 95. Yeah, because he liked because they had Altrix at the university in Helsinki and he liked it and so he actually set out to do that and the API and the way signals works work and other stuff in Linux early on were very very close to Altrix and of all the Linux uh, Unixes out there Altrix and Linux are the closest um, Dave Kotler hates Unix could be that's his problem I, I, I've met him when he was a, I don't know if he's still at Microsoft, but I met him maybe 15, 18 years ago. I met Dave Cutler when he was at Microsoft. And uh, another person who's a genius. Um, and, uh, but yeah, he has his own idea. So this is Altrix. And one cute thing I want to show you about is this. So these are interrupts. <laughs> and these are context switches, four context switches. Isn't that cute? Well, let me show you what's going on in Linux underneath. If I do pmstat1 here, context switch is 21,000 per second. And that's inside a virtual machine, uh, running, of course, on top of KVM by yours truly. Um, and uh, and then on top of a, of a x86 machine. So 28,000 context switches. And here you see this has <laughs> four context switches and free memory in kilobytes 25 kilobytes free memory it, i think it's so cute it's so nice to see stuff like that and um of course it also knows hecknet so i can do dlist oh what is it dls kitura so it goes out on hecknet and gets me the content of those images so i can copy them over i can of course so do the login uh let's see i don't know uh Dina, uh, the login. Yeah, so I can connect to any other machine from there as well. So, and this is not using TCP/IP. This is using uh, DeckNet Phase Four. So, um, oops, I uh, dropped out of the connection there. So, uh, that's. Um, all the operating systems I have here on one machine. Obviously, if this machine goes down, I uh, I lose all those um, all those machines as well, which are running on top of it. But um, that's fine. Now, in terms of applications, as you saw when when I when you logged in here to the live stream, that I have a bunch of games running and uh, and a bunch of uh, programming languages. I don't do that much programming on tech 
uh, VMS because it's not a natural environment for me. Most of the programming I do uh, was, yes, uh, Linus was for many years was developing Linux on Alpha. That's true, Larry. Um, uh, I, I know that he was running a, a, an Alpha machine donated by, uh, by Digital Equipment or HP maybe already at that time. So for a long, long time, it was developing the Linux kernel on an Alpha machine. Um, so yeah, so we have a bunch of games and um, and a bunch of programming languages. It's not natural for me to, as I was saying, to code on VMS. I don't know the API that well. I do almost all my coding on uh, on uh, Linux and of course on uh, an MVS. Um, so one more thing I wanted to show. We're getting to it's the end of this live stream. Is there's a machine which is a real. Uh, this machine is owned by Supratim, and that's a real hardware, um, a real hardware VMS machine. And there is an application on VMS called VUPS, which measures the speed of this particular machine and the standard is one VAX 11780 so it measures how much faster this particular machine is compared to VAX 11780 from the 19 early 1980s so this one is 11 uh, times faster uh, than uh, VAX 11780 but this is a real hardware machine and uh, uh, so I don't know if he is online let's check no I'm the only one here so this one is 11, let's see, what was it? 11 times faster than a, than a 11780. And now let's check my emulator machine, which let's remember, this runs on top of the SimH emulator, which runs on top of Linux, which runs on top of my KVM uh, hypervisor, which runs on top of real hardware. So let's see how fast this one is. Where is... Is the okay copy okay so let's see how fast this one is so whenever people tell me they want to buy a microvax or they want to buy like real hardware to run VMS yeah I mean it's fun uh, but remember for several things first they break down because they're old by now they're 20 years old um, number two, they're loud. Number three, they're slow. So you'll see soon here how fast this machine is. But of course, this is sharing, you know, this computer with all the other VMS machines inside this Linux, and then with all the other Linuxes running on that particular host at Google, of which I know nothing about, but there's for sure a few. So let's see how fast this machine comes back. I don't know why it's taking so long. But it will come back. Um, yeah, so this one is emulated 17 times faster than a VAX 11780, which is already quite a bit faster than the one on the real hardware run by SuperTeam. And uh, if I run it on a on my laptop or you know on my dedicated own machine at home with a three gigahertz processor, it was going to be like 40, 42. Uh, times faster than 11780 so still acceptable performance here even though we have all these machines crammed on top of a very small Linux virtual machine and uh, this all works fine the uptime for Linux here uh, let's see 112 days so very stable never have to do anything I just connect to it and work and have fun and uh, both HNET, HECnet, TCP IP it all works fine um, so this is my fax VMS environment. I have, as I said, 7, 3, 4.6, 4.7, 5.5, 6.1, 6.2, 7.3, and I also have a VMS 8.3 on alpha, running on an alpha emulator, uh, which I have here somewhere, but it's not on right now. This is emulator here, which emulates an alpha, as you can see here. So that also works fine, and uh, but I have no need for it, so that's why I'm not running. Uh, all in one machine, and um, 
And one thing I wanted to show you, if I connect to my mainframe here, so this is my ZPDT mainframe with ZVM. If I log in, can you see it? Uh, so I can do now um, tell system at hou vax1 hello from zvm and youtube live streaming. I don't know if you can see it. I M. Spencer asked, "What about HP Integrity Titanium servers?" Yes, I. I have an Itanium server here in my office. I, I can see it from where I'm sitting, and um, and I never use it. <laughs> it's uh, it's just another server, and it's slow. I don't know what what to do with it. So uh, I I kind of don't get the you know buying hardware to run VMS because uh, because it's not uh, not that much fun. Uh, I can also do now. Um, uh, send as I can send a command to to VMS from CVM uh, command HOU vax one show users and it will now go and find out which users logged in and, and tell me um, so all that works I can do also from here send command um, Moshix three CPQN it will tell me what's running on my mainframe. So you can see here this answered. It says that the system user is connected, which is true, that's me here. That they think by making it hard, first that they keep the bad guys out. No, the bad people, they will always find a way to run things illegally. Uh, but then you keep the good things, the good people out as well. So I don't know uh, if that in today's world still makes sense. But that's it, so I uh, gave you an overview of uh, of my Vax VMS setup, and let's have the computer play chess against itself here. Any other question that you have? Um, I don't know if you liked the. Uh, hey Jonathan, if you liked the uh, the live stream here, unscripted, and maybe in the next live stream we'll look more at uh, uh, more at mainframes, and maybe we'll do some live programming. That's what I really wanted to do in the beginning. I wanted to sit down on uh, MVS and write some REC software. But uh, maybe we'll do this in a future live stream. So that's it. It's, uh, it's noon New York time. Here's a question from Ian. Uh, speaking of license, wasn't there someone talking to IBM and opening up more recently? Yes, that was me. <laughs> uh, I did uh, petition IBM. We got, I think, 1,200 people to sign the petition I gave the petition to the top mainframe person at IBM Ross Mori who's the general manager worldwide for mainframes and they responded quite quickly uh, they were looking into it and then they looked into it and they said they were not going to do it so uh, yeah that was me uh, they said no we still the reason I asked for XA was because XA is a 31-bit architecture and it's very very old so it's 38 years old and so I thought that if we ask something that's 38 years old but still of value to the community because it's 31 bit then IBM would be would be open to it and they came back they said no they didn't want to do that they want people to use newer versions of uh, ZOS but only through IBM so uh, there's that yeah so in uh, I don't that was last I think was it last yeah it was last year in June probably exactly a year ago that's when petitioned then a month later or so they told yet no 31 bit for you so we're stuck with 16 uh, with 24 bit 16 megabytes I just released a video yesterday saying that if you want to have if you want to learn mainframe if you want to have fun then go with TK4 it's it, it, there's so much in it. You can be your own system program, you can IPL a machine, you can be the operator, you can mount tapes, you can do all this stuff. If you run ZOS on Hercules, A, it's going to be very slow. And 80% of the stuff that's in ZOS doesn't 
is is of no value to the enthusiast because you know we don't have thousands of petabytes of disks we don't have to we don't have to have backups uh, a lot of stuff really doesn't apply to us because we don't run real workloads um, because it doesn't make any sense to run ZOS and Hercules it's so slow and so um, ZOS a lot of people they say no I want to run ZOS and then and then what what do you do with it right uh, you get the ISPF editor okay we're gonna have ISPF now in update 9 um, do you want to deal with all the RECF with the workload management with the storage all that stuff I, I say it's no fun the only one thing that I wish we had in in MBS 3.8 which is in ZOS and we don't have it is Unix um, there is maybe a way to do it and somebody started working on it using the Zynu kernel uh, instead of Unix just reverse X I and U and started to port a Unix inside MBS 3.8 but with 16 megabytes it's just so restrictive that um, there's really not much you can do however we do have uh, Unix now on uh, on VM 370 because we can run the Amdol UTS Unix on on uh, on uh, VM 370 for people who want to do that again it's very it's all very old so Unix uh, version 6 <laughs> there's not much you can do with it it's not an ANSI compiler that's in it but we can do all that stuff anyway so uh, it's been an hour uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed this and uh, let me know if you think we should do this again on different topics if the format uh, if you like the format I will work on making sure the next time we have the full screen maybe the software doesn't support the resolution of my Mac machine here uh, maybe that's the problem maybe I have to get different software but uh, that's it so thank you very much for watching 